So let's rank the Mead telescopes in tiers. So when I first started doing this, I was going to do all the telescopes, everything in our industry. It turned out to be impractical because there's just too many. Our world is too large to fit on a little graph like this. And in particular, Mead started taking up almost one fourth of the entire graph. So I thought I would break out the Mead telescopes now, do them separately, then we can address the others later. So Mead started in 1972 brand labeling products from Japan, like a lot of other people did, Tasco and Hallmar and Royal Astro and Sears and all of the others. After that, they started brand labeling products from the US and then sort of fixing them up and massaging them into Mead products. And specifically, they would take cave astrola reflectors and dress them up and they would market them. And they were very successful at doing that. After that, they began making their own telescopes in a facility in California. This really grew to be a thing. At one point, they had a 160,000 square foot facility in California making telescopes. After that, there was a decline that happened, and it was pretty slow from 2010 up through about the 2020 time frame. And then they got sued, and they went out of business, but then they came back, and in one of the strangest turns of events ever, Orion bought them. It was good to see the Mead nameplate come back, but that whole Orion Mead partnership never quite felt right. And then suddenly, in mid-2024, Orion just went kaput, surprising everybody, including me. So right now, Mead is gone. But, you know, when we're talking about Mead, we're trying to review the, the company in general. It's almost like you're reviewing four or five separate companies in a row, but they're all under the umbrella of Mead, so we're gonna treat them this way. So we're gonna rank Mead telescopes from A through F, F being the trash bin, and there's, I think, 19 or 20 of these that I have here. You can take a look at this graphic that I have up here, see if you can guess where all of these are going to wind up. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started, uh, and let's do the ETX first. ETX, for a while, was the identity of Mead. It was the face of Mead. It was accompanied by an incredibly aggressive advertising campaign. I think it's probably the best ads I've ever seen on behalf of telescopes. And the ETX it, it was a turning point for Mead, although I don't think anybody realized it at the time. You see, Mead has always had very aggressive advertising, but they always had the product to back it up. Starting around the time of the ETX, the advertising started to exceed the product that you actually got, and that gulf would go wider as time went on. But it took the public quite a while to catch on to this. They were able to kind of coast on that model for quite some time. So in the meat advertisements, they pretty much almost came out and said, you're getting a Questar for $495. They stopped just short of using the name, but you could tell what they were getting at. So they were promising you a Questar for $495. What you got was a piece of plastic that broke. <laughs> so the optical tubes were pretty good. The drive bases were not good. They failed. And these days, an ETX optical tube orphaned from its mount is almost a cliche. But if you're willing to work with that a little bit, I mean, it's not perfect that flip mirror diagonal is not perfect and the visual back is plastic and you know but the eyepiece was good and the optics were good so i think we're going to go ahead and put the etx into the c category and that includes the maxitovs and the refractors all right so let's take a look at the schmidt newtonians Mead really wanted the Schmidt Newt to be a thing, and they took two runs at this at various points. One was in the 1980s with the MTS series. They had a six inch, and I reviewed that telescope here in another video. It's a very weird telescope. It had a fork mount, it had a helical focuser. But to get that thing up and running with everything that you needed, you have to buy all these accessories, and by the time you spent all that money, well, you probably could have bought something a little bit better. And then they took another one at the Schmidt Newton market with the LXD55 and LXD75 mounts. That was unfortunate because those two mounts have a well deserved reputation as being some of the worst equatorial mounts ever made. In fact, people I know who have the optical tubes, the mounts are all long gone by now. Sometimes we'll take that, those stickers and, and take them off. <laughs> and it was also from this unusual blue steel period of Mead. They were one of the first people to really embrace this offshore manufacturing. And they might have gone a little too soon and in a little too high volume because of the infrastructure I don't think was quite ready. 
there were quality control issues. The focusers in particular were very bad. And in fact, there is a aftermarket available for focusers for Meech Schmidt Newtonians from Moonlight and other people. Just keep in mind, if you're gonna buy one of these things, the cost of the focuser could exceed what you pay for the rest of the telescope. And the problem is when you get a bad focuser, you know, you never really shake that. It has so much of an effect on your experience with the telescope, and when the focuser is not good, it's just not good. But I have seen things where people have taken Schmied Newtonian optical tubes, put them on mounts, and they're very usable today. We're going to go ahead and put those into the C category. All right, the Mead Research Grade Newtonians. These were really good. Now, people have said to me, they're just rebranded cave astrolas with some 5 to 10% extra stuff on it. Well, that extra 10% can mean a lot because these were fantastic telescopes, some of the best things that Mead ever did, desirable today, not only as good optical instruments, but as beautiful pieces of industrial design. Those go into the A category. Similarly, the normal line of Newtonians from that time period, we're talking 1980s, the Model 628, the 826, and all of the other offshoots, the 645 I reviewed here, and in fact you see two of them, the Model 591, that's the student version of the 628 6-inch F8 Newtonian, and the 826, probably the most popular telescope from that time frame, the 8-inch F6. We're going to go ahead and put those into the B category, and I'm going to actually give them a little bit of a bump up. I'm going to call those a B plus. Now, after those Newtonians left, they came out with the Starfinder series, and the saying is, Mead and Newtonians, they went from first to worst. <laughs> those were terrible telescopes. I don't know what it is, but I kept buying them. I've owned the 6, the 8, the 10, and I kind of semi-owned the 12, and I kept buying them, and finally it dawned on me after several years, you know, these things are terrible. <laughs> We've gotten into some morbid debates here. Are the Dobbs worse, or are the equatorial versions worse? And I have a very strong opinion on this. The equatorial versions were definitely worse, if for no other reason they were much more expensive. So we're going to go ahead and put the Starfinder Dobbs in the D category and the Starfinder Equatorials also in the D category, but I'm going to put them as a D minus. So luckily after this, they came out with the Lightbridge series of Dobbs, and it was a nice recovery from the Starfinders. The Lightbridge is very good, discontinued sadly later on in Mead's lifetime, but I like those a lot. We're going to go ahead and put those into the B category. The 400 series refractors, only available for a couple of years. They didn't sell very many of them. Beautiful, beautiful brand labeled Unitron 4 inch F15s, the Unitron number 152. I have a Unitron number 152, and there's been debate among collectors as to whether the Unitron version or the Mead version is more desirable. You would think the Unitron would be the more valuable of the two because it was just a higher end brand to begin with, but because there weren't very many of the Meads made, you could make the argument that the Meads are actually worth more. I have seen these things sell for as much as eight or $10,000 in pristine condition. There's somebody I know in the Boston area who has two of these Mead 400 series refractors, and I went over to see him once, and he has an attic where he keeps close to 100 telescopes, and when I got into the room, it just took my breath away. I said, did you polish that? Did you wax that or something? He says, no, that's just the way it came from the factory. Stunningly beautiful. I just sat there and admired that for quite some time. I'm gonna go ahead and put the Mead 400 series into the A category. Mead DS series, that's an easy F. Those were cheap plastic junk. You know, Mead was very good at marketing, but I don't know how they screwed this up. The name is just bad. Anybody seeing that DS immediately thinks of the term department store. Similarly, we have a series of department store grade telescopes that I refer to as XXX by Mead. XXX could be any number of words depending on when you bought them. It could be Infinity by Mead, Polaris by Mead, Telstar by Mead, Jupiter by Mead, Saturn by Mead. It was all the same junk. And I had someone say to me, they kept changing the name to get rid of reviewers or to try to run away from them. Those get an easy F. The ED series refractors, again, from that blue steel era, LXD650 and LXD750 mount. Those of you who have been following me since the late 1990s know that that seven inch, that flagship model that they had, 
actually got my start in this career, if that's what you want to call it. I was just writing about something that happened to my friend Mike who bought one of those things. It went back to me several times. It kept coming back and it was never right. And it was obvious after a time it was never going to be right. In the past 25 years, I've had the opportunity to see many of those ED series refractors and it's only reinforced my impression that those things were just those were not good. They had optical tube problems and the mounts were no good. So I think if we were going to grade this, it, just on technical terms, the ED series refractors might be in the C category, but I think they're going to get a downgrade because of what they were and what they represented within the Mead line. These were flagship products and they were very expensive. So I'm going to go ahead and put those ED series refractors in the D category and make them a D+. Another line of telescope I don't really like talking about are the early RCX models. Mead was selling those until somebody said, you can't use the name RC, that's a trademark term, and they turned into the ACFs. Again, if we're grading this just on technical proficiency, those scopes might be in the C category, but we do have to give those a significant downgrade because the quality was just not there. They were by fair margin, the most expensive telescopes that Mead ever sold, and they were sold as a flagship product, and they were just awful. Uh, you know, if you spend that much money on a telescope, you shouldn't have to worry whether the thing's going to work if you turn it on or not. So now we get to the LX200. 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, that was the heart of the line. This is Mead's bread and butter. When you think of Mead telescopes, you think of an 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. These are easily recommendable. The one thing that I will caution you on in any LX200 mount, and indeed on any Mead computerized mount, is reliability. Reliability is a plague on all Mead drive bases. And when you get to LX200s that are more than about eight or nine years old, I just assume the thing has problems or that it will have problems pretty soon. But having said that, you know, LX200, LX50, LX10, anything in that series, those are very recommendable telescopes today. They are solidly in the B category. In fact, I'd say a Mead LX200 is the very definition of a B-class product. I'm going to give a minor D merit to the F6.3 versions. They weren't quite as good, the quality control was not quite as good, and towards the end of the X6.3 era, I think they started to get a little bit better, but they were never up to the quality of the F10s. So I'm going to give a slight D merit to the F6.3 versions and call them a B-. But even after saying all of this, I'm going to tell you, a clean used 8-inch LX200 is your best overall buy in a used Mead telescope. I'm also going to break out the LX90 separately from the LX200. The LX90 was a lighter weight, less expensive version of the LX200, and it showed. <laughs> I have a review of the LX90 8-inch somewhere on this channel. It's about three years ago since I've done that. Since I did that review, I've had a steady stream, I wouldn't call it a torrent, but it's a trickle of comments coming in from 8-inch LX90 owners telling me that, that my review was a little bit too positive. And looking back, yes, I think it probably is. This was a less reliable, less robust, and shakier version of the LX200, albeit at a lower cost. So I'm going to give the LX90 a minor demerit and call them a B- minus as well. If you do get an LX90, get the 8-inch. Don't get the 10-inch. It's too strong for the fork mount that they have on it. And whatever you do, don't buy a 12-inch LX90. Now, in this range, we also have the 7-inch Mac. This is one of my favorite Mead telescopes of all time. That one might make the A category, except it has a well-known fatal flaw. They put this giant piece of metal in the back to weigh the thing down, and so the fork arm assembly was just way too heavy. And the only reason they did that is to assume commonality in parts with the 8-inch LX200. It's such an inelegant solution. The last thing you want with a Mac is a big heat hoarding piece of metal in the back. And yes, there are directions about how to take that thing out. There's an excellent thread on Cloudy Nights on how to do that. But I would not try that unless you are very, very sure about what you are doing. And just as a point of reference, I've seen how that's done. I would not attempt that operation by myself. So sadly, I want to put the seven inch Mac in the A category, but I've got to downgrade it to a B. And to close out this whole Schmidt-Cassegrain era, 
the older ones, the LX3, the LX5, the LX6, and the LX100 are getting old at this point. The dry bases have failed and coatings on both the corrector plate and the mirrors are starting to fade as well. I'm going to downgrade those to a C level. Now there have been so many LX models, it's hard to keep them straight. Some people say that the lower numbers were older and the bigger numbers were higher. That's not exactly true because the LX200, the LX50, and the LX10 were newer models, and the LX356 and 100 were the older models. So be careful and watch out for that. And one last word here, most people looking for the LX250-10 series will go for the 200, but these days I think it's the 10 that's becoming more reliable and more desirable because there were very little electronics inside the thing. It was just a right ascension tracking mount. And those things have actually held up a lot better because there's just simply less stuff inside of them to fail. Let's not forget about the four inch mid grains. These for some reason were not as good as the bigger ones. I don't know why. We're gonna put them in class C. You know, there were three models near the back of the Mead catalog for quite some time. Nobody seemed to pay them any attention, but these, these were good and these are worth seeking out. And these are the model number 390, the model 395, and the 4500. Now the 390 was a 90 millimeter refractor on an alt as mount. The 395 put it on an equatorial mount, and the 4500 was this ubiquitous four and a half inch F8 Newtonian. But those were pretty good, and especially now, because they're getting old, you see these things being given away, sometimes for free. If that comes up anywhere near you, consider picking one of those up. The only caution I want to make to you on the 4500 is you want to get the 4500. Don't get any of the variants, especially the ones beginning with 44, because those are the ones that have 0.965 inch eyepieces. You don't want those. You want the Mead 4500. I'm going to put those in the C category. I think probably they're a little bit less than that from a pure technical perspective, but because they are good and they, they are cheap and they were never very expensive to begin with, we give them a mild bump up because they're such a bargain. And finally, anything on the aforementioned LXD55, LXD75, the LXD300, the LXD500, most of those telescopes were not very good, and the mounts, of course, were pure junk. We're just going to group all those together and put them in class D. Okay, so here's your tiers. And looking at this, this is better than I thought it was going to look. I thought this was going to skew a lot more negative than it has, but it's been pretty balanced from top to bottom here. But I do want to keep this in mind. Mead, they were an 8-inch LX200 company. That's what they were. So I would say Mead is a three-legged stool. They were 8-inch LX200s, they were ETX, and then there were the department store telescopes. A lot of this other stuff was limited run, one-off editions that didn't last very long, so it kind of clutters up the graph a little bit. What I often tell people with Mead, you want to stay in the middle. Stay in the middle of their lineup. In other words, don't buy the department store grade junk, but also don't buy the expensive flagship stuff. They weren't very good at that. They didn't make very many of them. They didn't make enough of them to work the kinks out. You need to stay in the middle. And the LX200 is sort of in that upper middle class category. It's right in the sweet spot. Okay, folks, there you have it. Mead, tears. I hope you enjoyed this. I had a lot of fun making it. I hope you had fun watching it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.